boy, you better make this shot, eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, will you shut up? But I guess this is pretty important, I, I think. Honestly, shut up. Let me shoot. I mean, I just want to make sure that you know I want that. Okay, okay. Oh, I hope you make this shot so much! <laughs> oh. <sighs> well, 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 look at that, huh? Uh, well, there's only one hit. Yeah, I can see that. You always shoot well. You can't blame this on me. Yes, I know I could shoot better normally. But if you weren't nattering 20 miles an hour, I would have. Jesus. Look. You know that one pound prize that the captain was giving out? Hmm? Huh? Yeah, well, I wanted to win it. Now, with that, I won't. That Plunkett's probably gonna take it all. Who's Plunkett? W was it something I said? The 95th and their weapon, the infantry rifle, known today as the Baker rifle, have held a deserving place in military history as an elite corps, distinct in dress, weapons, and capability from the vast majority of the remainder of the army. While generalizations about slow-moving, unthinking automatons forming the ranks of the battalions of the line are largely inaccurate, so too can be the near-superhuman capabilities in marksmanship, tactical nuance, and roles played attributed to the riflemen of the 95th. Although the 95th were one of two such rifle-armed units of the British Army, notwithstanding Allied and King's German Legion riflemen. They were not alone in the role they played on the battlefield. They were, in essence, a subset of the larger light infantry arm that would, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, number some seven other regiments, all trained in the same techniques. Of course, these red-coated light infantrymen, as compared to the riflemen of the 95th and the 60th, differed in one key aspect, their weapon being the smoothbore musket. So, although trained in similar techniques and tactics to the remainder of the late infantry, the 95th were able to bring a singular capability to bear over their red-coated brethren. Range. The Baker rifle was indeed a much more capable arm than the Brown Bess carried by the rest of the infantry, and it was able to project its firepower at near three times the range of the musket. Harnessing the capability of the weapon was something that required training and practice. Time spent on the range was critical, and integral to the efficiency of a rifle battalion. Here, in part one of this series, we'll examine musketry as practiced by the 95th Rifles in the age of Napoleon, including the background and basic range practices. When compared to the documentation of the later Victorian era, that of the Napoleonic era is frustratingly vague or non-existent. There are some references that give important glimpses into the training and musketry of the riflemen of the early 1800s. One such is the translation of a German work by Francis de Rottenberg, entitled Regulations for the Exercise of Riflemen and Light Infantry, dating from 1798. One of the earliest works of the era, it was reissued a number of times during the first two decades of the 19th century. In addition, one of the fathers of the Rifle Corps in the British Army, Coote Manningham, penned a work known as The Regulations for the Rifle Corps in 1801. Manningham's work can be found contained in a few modern books, including DeWitt Bailey's British Military Flintlock Rifles, Ben Townsend's Regulations of the Rifle Corps, and Stephen Summerfield and Sue Law's volume The Baker Rifle and Early Campaigns of the 95th Rifles. As mentioned earlier, specific reference has been made to the 95th. We can also infer by the references that similar training was undertaken by other rifle-armed units, such as certain battalions of the 60th, as well as other foreign corps. Now, a full background into the formation and early training of the Rifle Corps may be somewhat outside the scope of this video. However, it might be important to explain some of the more important aspects. The story begins with the petition of the army by two men, Coote Manningham and William Stewart, to form a regiment of rifle-armed men, hitherto a non-existent entity in the British Army. Notwithstanding, of course, some of the battalions of the 60th Regiment, who wore green coats with red facings. 
This would become known as the Experimental Corps of Riflemen, and after a short period of time entered the line as the 95th Rifles. Perhaps the most important part of the early years was their posting to the camp at Shorncliffe in southern England. There, along with two other red-coated regiments, the 43rd and the 52nd, would train under Sir John Moore and eventually become the Army's first dedicated light infantry battalions, grouped together as the Light Brigade. This would later expand to form the Light Division of Peninsular War fame. As noted, two of these three battalions wore red coats and carried muskets, but the 95th wore green and carried the infantry rifle. Selected as the British Army's rifle for the new century, the weapon was the invention of Ezekiel Baker, a gunsmith in London. His design of rifling and the tidy, handy, Germanic features of the stock won out in competition, and thus the Baker rifle would be carried by the riflemen of the British Army until the very late 1830s, when it was replaced by the Brunswick. A large part of this light infantry training was in musketry. The nature of the light infantry battle was such that targets would typically be individuals on the battlefield, notwithstanding the engagement of massed formations in close order. Engagement of the enemy skirmishers would require specific attention and care paid in regards to marksmanship over and above that given to battalions of the line. So just what did musketry training of the era look like? Care and cleaning were an obvious part of all infantry training, and the rifles were no different. From the scant references, there are mentions of various fire positions, namely the usual standing, but also emphasis is placed on the kneeling, as theoretically it might see more use, and the lying position as well. While no specific drills or explanations are detailed, there are mentions of the use of these positions in various treatises, and also in reference to tactical considerations, rather than full-blown instructions on how to perform the said evolutions. I might make mention of the fact that a video on these very fire positions has been produced on the channel already, and while this video will not go into the details of them, you can certainly view them there. As you might expect, being the infancy of the standardized use of rifled arms in the army, things are quite vague, and the details that we associate with later Victorian manuals regarding foot placement, holding and aiming are frustratingly absent. Some of this can be gleaned from works such as Ezekiel Baker's own book, 23 Years Practice and Observation with Rifle Guns, which details fire positions, loading techniques, and other procedures of his recommendation. In any of the texts, there was no reference to the order of dress worn for musketry practice. Later, in the Victorian era, much use was made of drill order or musketry order. That is, in essence, a stripped-down version of the personal equipment, usually minus the knapsack and certainly minus any of the campaign equipment such as haversack and water bottle. As for the actual range work, there is mention of it in the de Rottenberg text, albeit quite cursory. The Manningham volume goes into more detail. As with most references of the era, a certain amount of cross-referencing must be done to get a full picture of what was actually accomplished. De Rottenberg's description is logical, seen here, but lacks any detail of the execution. He advocates shooting from 50 to 300 yards. Manningham goes a bit farther to detail a more specific series of practices, ranging from 90 to 300 yards. He goes on to support this with rudimentary standards for classes of shot, first, second, and third, with the third class being the most proficient. So, in his system, the first or awkward class of men shot predominantly at 90 and 140 yards. Inclusion in this class was simply the inability to attain the standard of the second class. The standard of that class reads as follows. As shown here, any rifleman who put two shots in the round target or two in the body of the figure target at the second range, that is to say 140 yards and upwards, out of the six, for two days firing out of three, will be ranked in the second class and wear a small white cockade. Failure to achieve this would result in demotion to the first or awkward class. If a rifleman could put four shots in the round target or three in the body of the figure out of six at the third range or greater, that being 200 yards or more, for two days out of three, would be ranked as a marksman of the third class and wear a green cockade. 
So you can see there is a certain degree of vagueness attached to these regulations. A choice of ranges for the second and the third class don't make particular sense to the modern shooting mind. That said, there were minimums associated with these regulations, and it is these minimums that we will be focusing on as the project develops. These examples can be backed up with some anecdotal evidence. William Surtees, a veteran of the 95th, wrote a memoir entitled 25 Years in the Rifle Brigade. In it, he recalls as a recruit shooting from what was termed a horse, in effect, a rest to hold the rifle. He also recalls as a recruit shooting from 50 yards under the supervision of a somewhat generous and encouraging officer. There are other divisional or regimental orders that provide evidence as to the shooting parameters of the day. Now, ammunition is something that has been covered extensively on the channel, and I invite you to view the three-part series on it if you haven't already. From Army regulations, these ones dating from 1811, Riflemen were issued 60 rounds of ball ammunition for practice per year. These were delivered in two batches, one in the spring and one in the fall, of 40 and 20 rounds respectively. It is also of note that there is a stipulation that ammunition could be made up at regimental level as a peculiarity in the rifles. To what degree this refers to home-based training activities or to actual campaigning is not mentioned. Typically for the army, ammunition was pre-made and stored and transported in barrels. As discussed previously on the channel, the use of paper cartridges was prolific in the rifle corps. But it seems to remain that forced ball using loose patched ball and powder was still thought of as the proper, if formal, way of loading the rifle, even if the realities of campaigning in the Peninsular War negated the use of them. As this video will demonstrate a somewhat conventional type of range work, it is this latter version of ammunition that will be used. The charge I use is 3.5 drams, or 96 grains, under the aforementioned loose patched ball, which measures some 0.594 in diameter. The material I use for patching is some 22 thousandths in thickness. This is the standard load I use with all Baker shooting. Targetry was detailed in both the de Rottenberg and the Manningham volumes. As before, the former is somewhat vague, recommending a target, presumably round, of some 5 feet in diameter. The Manningham volume goes into more detail, and it's his examples that I've decided to use. The targets he prescribes are of two types, a round version and a figure. The round target was 4 feet in diameter, and marked with a series of rings. A bull of one and a half inches was surrounded with two inch thick rings, with their inner radius being four inches, nine inches, and fifteen inches respectively. Just inside the outer four foot diameter was the scoring zone. This was formed by drawing an imaginary line one inch inside the circumference of the four foot diameter target. The rings served only as an aid to aiming and had nothing to do with scoring. The center of the target was to be between 3 foot 4 inches and 4 foot 2 inches off the ground. The second target was the figure. Measuring either 6 feet or 5 foot 5 inches, it was painted on a screen that measured 7 feet by 3 feet. The image was of a soldier with ordered arms, or alternately, a man with crossed arms. Students of the Baker will be familiar with this example that's found in Baker's book. Although shown mounted to a slightly different background, I decided that it would be the best example of a man with his arms crossed. My version differs slightly, as it's fastened to a screen which was 6 feet by 4 foot wide, versus the 7 by 3 of the text. For scoring, there was an imaginary line drawn a half inch inside the outside edge of the figure, and anything below the knee did not count. There was also supposed to be an aiming mark consisting of an 8-inch ring, 2 inches wide, that I neglected to place on the target. The practices I decided to demonstrate for this project were a blend of the anecdotal and the prescribed. I termed the short-range practices as the recruit practices, very much my own designation. The first such was an anecdotally-based 50-yard practice of simply five rounds from the standing position. 
What is missing from any of the descriptions is details surrounding the execution of these practices. What position to fire in, for example. Therefore, I took some cues from tactical notes of the era, referring to common or preferred fire positions, and for this practice, the more standard and familiar standing position would be used. This would be a perfect time to familiarize the recruit with this position, as the target was close and hitting it was easier. Another aspect of these close-range practices was the ability to zero one's rifle. While not perhaps the complicated procedure of later years, knowing where the rifle shot, according to the sights, was important, especially when ranges increased. One, two, three, four, five. That is an absolutely recruit-sized grouping. Yeah. Taken as an example of a recruit's initial foray into firing ball rather than a comprehensive examination, five hits represent some degree of competency, and practice at 90 yards could then commence. A similar approach was taken for the 90-yard practice, a simple five-round application. Here, of course, the same target was used, but this time it was shot from the kneeling position, used as a representation of a possible scheme. It's important to emphasize that these recruit practices, as I've called them, could have been much more comprehensive, with multiple practices shot in different positions, as a means to familiarize the man with the skills they would need. There is virtually no information regarding these simple introductory practices. Although fired from the kneeling position, loading was achieved in the standing position, this being by far the most common and expedient method. So, there was the five round, 90 yard recruit practice. One, two, three, four, five. Not exactly minute of gnat, shall we say. However, these first practices, the 50 and the 90 yard ones, were very much intended as an introduction to shooting of the Baker. Recruits, perhaps more than likely actually, had never even shot uh, a long arm before in their lives, and the training for it would have had to start from the very basics. So the results that we've achieved here, which not exactly are stunning, are they? However, if we match them against the, the backdrop of the history, then I would guess that they would be pretty typical of what would be achieved by the recruit. And the size of the groupings and the position on the target would be an indication to their NCOs that they could perhaps move to the next level of difficulty and on into the, uh, the, the trained soldiers practices at 140, uh, 200 uh, officially, and on to 300 yards. As mentioned, well within the standards of the day. Although some trained men did shoot at these short ranges, they would predominantly shoot at 140 yards or greater, as will be demonstrated in part two. There, we'll discuss the practices of trained riflemen, some advanced shooting, as well as discuss some of the badges and awards given for good shooting. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.